Before Jonathan Kent the Superman can rejoin the fight, he must come to terms with the horrible acts he committed while under the control of Amanda Waller. What'll happen next? Well, let's hop into the pages of Absolute Power Super Sun issue number one. A tie into this ongoing event and find what happens next together, shall we? So then as we join the book, we check on in with John flying over the Themyscira not long after the vanquishing. Of the Brainiac Queen, he's obviously pretty happy because it looks like the good guys are finally gonna be able to turn things around on Waller and Task Force 7, and also because during that last raid, Aquaman and company actually managed to rescue Jay Nakamura, John's boyfriend. The two are excited to be reunited soon, but unfortunately that's going to have to wait as word has come down from Nightwing that before John can re-enter the battle. The Amazonian Smiths and scientists are going to need to run some tests on the young Superman to make sure that no malicious Brainiac Queen code was left behind. And I mean, honestly, this makes a lot of sense. I mean, how many times in this story do we find out way too late? that some kind of Achilles heel or trigger code was inserted into our heroes' heads when they weren't paying attention. With the help of Io and the other Amazonians, John is able to take an inward journey inside his own mind, and it's right around here things start getting really trippy. He imagines a limo being driven by Damien. His best friend and fellow super son, John, gets ushered inside the limo where he ends up finding Dreamer waiting for him, but not just Dreamer, Goldie, you may remember that as the cat, that John accidentally killed with his heat vision when his powers first activated way back when. Honestly, I'm surprised at such a deep cut. It's also around here, too, that John and by extension me, the reader, come to the realization that, oh yeah, I guess Dreamer died sacrificing herself in that big battle at the Fortress of Solitude from a couple issues ago. Personally, I really must have misread that issue. I assumed that Nia would have just used her Dreamer powers to slide away, but no, according to this issue, she is actually dead. Which, as you might have guessed, ends up hitting the young Superman like a ton of bricks. He led that attack as the cyborg Superman, and as such, her death is kind of on his hands. In fact, it's at that moment John's memory ends up completely opening up as he remembers multiple horrible things he did while working for Waller. We're actually treated to a high-flying little action scene wherein we see John as the cyborg Superman arresting Huntress. No, not the Helena Wayne Huntress from Justice Society. This is the Helena Bertinelli version. And we know that because she mentioned her Time in Spiral, Huntress fights valiantly against the mechanical Super Sun, but in the end, it's just not enough, and she ends up being taken to Waller. It's here we learn that Waller had actually intended for Dreamer to stick around and be a big part of her final plan to defeat the Super Community once and for all, but in her death, Waller weirdly respects her as a foe. Though, the Wall does openly wonder what the hell she's going to do with Dreamer's parents. She was only keeping them around as an insurance policy, and now that Dreamer is dead, she doesn't need them anymore. Now, just when the Amazons think they've purged all the evil left behind by the Brainiac, Queen John ends up needing to go deeper and deeper. It seems that the Queen nestled herself good and deep inside John's subconscious, and every time they think they finally got a lead on her, she just ends up going deeper or distracting them with a memory, like a time wherein John may have defeated the drummer boy. It's while fighting the Brainiac Queen's echo inside his own mind, John is helped out by Dreamer, or at least a mental projection created by by John's own mind, though admittedly this Dreamer doesn't act like any of the other characters inside John's mind. This Dreamer seemingly tries to protect John by locking him up in a nice pleasant memory with all of his friends, though of course this memory doesn't quite line up to the truth, for one Alfred is alive here. And once John finds out this is the truth, he only ends up fighting harder against the Brainiac Queen's control, which seems to be growing stronger and stronger the deeper inside himself he plunges. All of this ends up coming to a massive head where it looks like John is going to be assimilated and turned into a cyborg Superman once again, if only for the mental image of Dreamer to step in, and tell John the only way he's going to win this fight is if he's willing to let go of all of this baggage. The longer he keeps it in, the more the Brainiac Queen is going to thrive on all these negative feelings. It's here, too, that the young Superman also remembers that he never even wanted to fight the Brainiac Queen originally. He wanted to bring her down by revealing the truth that Waller has been lying to her and manipulating her since the jump. And in the end, this line of thinking proves to be just enough to vanquish the last of the Brainiac Queen's code. But we're still not done with the story, though, as John actually sticks around in his own mind for a little bit with the mental projection.
direction of Dreamer, and this is where things really start. Kind of going off the rails, you see John and Dreamer talk about how close they are and how much they've been through, and admittedly, Dreamer has been present in a lot of John Superman stories. But then they start getting all starry-eyed with one another and talking about how much the other means, and wow, did this come out of left field. Did I miss something in one of those Dreamer stories? Are they really implying here that there might have been some sort of romantic attraction between these two? Because I certainly didn't glean that from reading the John books. And why here and why now in this event story when John just got over the guilt of having a hand in Dreamer's own death? If this feels incredibly awkward to you too, don't worry, you ain't seen nothing yet because once John's mental state has been addressed and he's finally cleared to join the fight once again, he's finally allowed to have a meeting with Jay. John, of course, opens up to his boyfriend about losing Dreamer and how guilty he feels about the whole thing, but if you read the prelude to Absolute Power, you will know that Jay absolutely hates Dreamer. And that's because Dreamer, while shanghaied into servitude by Waller, assisted the Suicide Squad in conquering Jay's home nation of Gamora and killing his mother, the President. Ooh, boy, this feels bad. Bad. <laughs> and again, I know what you're thinking. Did they really give Jonathan Kent the Superman a whole tie-in story to this big event just to break him up from his boyfriend? No, John eventually does manage to get Jay back by saying they've lost so much already and he can't stand to lose him now, especially not when they're on the eve of victory, but it's made abundantly clear that this argument is just gonna get tabled for a later date. And yeah, the comic ends with Jonathan Kent the Superman leaving the Themyscira behind to once again rejoin the battle and hope hopefully lend a hand in defeating Amanda Waller once and for all. And so that was Absolute Power Super Sun issue number one, everybody. And if you couldn't tell, this was a deeply strange and heavily uneven little tie-in story. One that tries to do too many things at once and doesn't really do a good job of any of them. On one hand, I can respect a story for trying to resolve John of all the sins he committed as the Super Sun while under Amanda Waller's control. I mean, that had to have been done eventually and because he doesn't have a book right now. You might as well have him work through his guilt somewhere, and to Cena Grace's credit, this book actually does a good job pulling different continuity threads from a bunch of different stories in John's history. We got Goldie the Cat, we got allusions to Mr. Oz, and even John's short stint in the Injustice universe. But it's the latter half of the book that really ends up throwing me for a loop. Did you know Dreamer was so important in the life of John? I mean, it sure didn't seem that way in the stories I was reading. <laughs> also, you know, breaking up heroes for cheap drama is never cool. It's a lazy writing trick that never really pans out, but it feels like this whole issue was constructed for the sole purpose of breaking up John and Jay, and then they just don't do it at the end. Maybe they're hoping if this story gets enough eyes on it and they whip enough fans up into a frenzy one way or another, they can spin that off into a new ongoing for John, which admittedly I would like to see. Just, you know, maybe with a different creative team and a different pitch than this one right here. Overall, I'd feel comfortable giving this one a 6 out of 10. The first half is pretty solid, but the second half really kind of left a bad taste in my mouth, and that's a shame, because up until now, I would say Absolute Power has had some pretty strong tie-ins. Hey there, everyone. It's your pal, Cape Jewel again, and if you're seeing my face right now, that means you watched at the end of the video, and I'll always be grateful for that. Retention helps in this crazy YouTube game, and so does becoming a patron. If you head on down to the description, you can find a link to my Patreon page. Recently just redid all the tiers. A lot of cool stuff offering up there. Exclusive commentaries, exclusive polls, uh, behind-the-scenes concept art for Capes and Quest. That's the brand new D&D show I've started soon. Never been a better time to become a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and help the channel grow and you know help me continue to deliver content like what you just saw so i want to thank you all and i will see you again next time bye bye